Hi, welcome on the platform of your PD education. And uh, as you know, your PD team, your PD has covered the first ever research and development, uh, you know, that event in uh, fair in IIT Delhi on 15th of October 2022. And we could meet many of the professors and researchers and students there. And uh, professors displayed their uh, projects, some of the latest projects which they are doing. And uh, this particular series you are watching is uh, related to that only. We are interacting with the, uh, some professors, some um, you know researchers, and trying to know what their project is and what their area of specialization is. My today's interaction is uh, with Professor Nishit Shrivastav. He is the professor in Computer Science Department of IIT Kanpur. A wonderful person, and uh, this is the most uh, uh, honest, frank, and candid interview I ever had. I must say that. Uh, professor uh, is uh, basically background from electrical engineering background and then after that he has done his doctorate in computer science. Uh, one of his projects, uh, adaptive routing, routing system for physical delivery services was, uh, you know, showed in the fair, uh, R&D fair and uh, have uh, interacted with him related to that only and some more domains you know, of his specialization. He's also into cognitive sciences. And his PhD uh, work itself is very interesting thing. If you visit his website, you will find many things there, many interesting things there. So let's go and interact, interact with Professor Srivastava. Okay, welcome Professor Nishin Srivastava and thanks a lot for your time. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, Professor Srivastava uh, recently in the first ever research and development uh, fair, which held, was held in IIT Delhi in October 15th and 14th. Uh, one of your project was displayed there, that is adaptive routing system for physical delivery services. So uh, I'm going to interact uh, with you related to that particular uh, project only and some more interactive uh, interaction points I have collected. So if you allow me, I can proceed with the first one. Certainly. Yeah. So Professor, you have done your graduation uh, in electrical engineering from IIT Madras and then uh, uh, you joined as professor. You are presently professor in computer science department of IIT Kanpur. So this trajectory of career is normally not observed. So I I, I was getting curious that uh, what uh, why you decided to proceed from electrical to computer science. Um, well, fundamentally, I was interested in understanding how behavior can be modeled. Okay. That was my primary motivation. Okay. Um, it just so happens that. Um, at my J rank in 2002, um, I could get electrical, not computer science. But within electrical engineering, I focused on control systems um, and things that were more related to behavior. Mm -hmm. And then when I got the chance to move into a PhD in computer science, that's what I did. So it was primarily a function of interest. Okay. So so I was going through your uh, entire academic profile, and I found that after BTEC, you have done your direct PhD because I could not find masters. So uh, can you can you please share with us why uh, only direct PhD, what are the advantages did you see that time to go for direct PhD after graduation? Um, so since I got my PhD in the US, uh, the US system is much more flexible in this regard. The only reason I didn't have get my master's is I forgot to put in the paperwork for it. So I just took my PhD. Uh, I could have taken a master's also. Um, the thing is that in my bachelor's, I was very active in research. Mm -hmm. And since I was active in research and I had published um, out of my undergrad degree, um, I was attractive as a PhD applicant um, at the places I applied to. And so they gave me an admission into the PhD program. And generally in the PhD program, you can also get a master's on the way. But as I said, I forgot to uh, put in the paperwork for that. So I just have a PhD. But now, now we have this trend in India also, like uh, now universities are providing, offering uh, direct PhD opportunities to students. I may yeah. ask you, Professor, that uh, how a student should decide, because that is in the mind of students that after graduation, PhD is a very uh, big uh, commitment on the part of students, five, six years of investment. So how do they decide whether they are suitable for this uh, arduous journey of PhD, whether they should go for that or not, or uh, what is your advice uh, to such students? My advice for PhD applicants is always simple. You should not do a PhD. Okay. <laughs> Only people who are sufficiently motivated to disregard that advice okay. um, will end up doing a PhD. Um, I always universally say don't do a PhD. And any specific reason for that, Professor? Well, all the reasons that you mentioned. Um, um, ultimately, 
what when you are doing a PhD, you are becoming a specialist in a very narrow area. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be a specialist, then you become a specialist. But a lot of times what happens is that people do a PhD to put off uncertainty about what they will do. Mm -hmm. And this is actually very damaging. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to keep your options open, you don't specialize. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something I always push back against when kids tell me I don't want to do a job in industry. Therefore, I'll do a PhD. I say, no, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Because when you're doing a PhD, you're making yourself fundamentally unemployable, mm -hmm. um, except in the very narrow niche discipline that you will do your PhD in. Mm -hmm. And that's something that people don't think about when they make that decision. So I always say no. Okay. But if somebody is committed to specializing, mm -hmm. all power to them. Okay. So, Professor, I have uh, two more queries related to your this answer prompt and very frank answer which you have given. Number one, uh, I am wondering how the PhD students under your guidance must be keeping themselves motivated, knowing where the view of their guide that, okay, is not very much motivating for PhD. And second is how shall we get the, you know, uh, good mentors, teachers, faculties, researchers, if uh, students uh, don't go for that? Yeah, so the answer to both of your questions are related. Um, my students are the ones who don't listen to my advice. Okay. Um, and since they don't listen to my advice, I help them in whatever way I can. And ultimately, um, the you don't need all that many teachers. Um, PhDs are massively oversupplied in this country as well as in other countries. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the ones that 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 don't follow my advice will still be a pretty big number. Uh, so that's okay. that's my joint answer to both your questions. Okay, I must I must uh, say that uh, professor, you are the first academician I've seen. I'm very honest. Uh, answer you have given and uh, I'm very sure those students uh, the indirect way to understand that is unless until you are very much interested in the domain you should not uh, join the degree for the sake of degree I mean you should go there if you have commitment for that so that is wonderfully said sir uh, you have done PhD in computer science from University of Minnesota and you have written a PhD thesis titled computational investigation of being in the world thesis appears to be a blend of computer science and philosophy so am I right in that, sir? Um, I mean, I would say a blend of computer science and psychology. Um, essentially, when I got into my PhD program, I was fundamentally interested in reinforcement learning. Okay. Um, and in re reinforcement learning, there's this notion of, uh, of agents learning from rewards. Mm -hmm. And when you try and explain human behavior using um, reinforcement learning, then you say, well, humans also learn using rewards. Um, and then I was sort of confused about what is actually rewarding and what we think of as valuable. Mm. Um, how do we know that? Mm. So this is sort of the point where I got stuck mm. and I didn't have an answer for it. Um, and that became the basis for my PhD. So it was a slightly philosophical um, investigation of where valuations come from mm. and uh, where rewards come from. And I was dissatisfied with that because I was in a computer science program and I was asking these questions. So I, then I went on and did a, a postdoc in psychology mm -hmm. where I was able to try and answer these questions um, in a more appropriate manner. And that's that's essentially where my PhD was. It was I was asking this question, I didn't have an answer, and that questioning essentially became the PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. Professor Shivastav, this uh, entire reinforcement learning which you just mentioned is one form of the learning. and uh, we study all these things in the cognitive sciences, also cognitive behavioral sciences, also in psychology, as you mentioned. Uh, and we see that uh, this department of cognitive sciences, behavioral sciences is now popping up in many of the institutes. I want to uh, seek your uh, uh, you know, view on this. Like, what do you think of this uh, department of cognitive sciences? And what is the, uh, you know, uh, I mean, why do we need this department? And what are the career opportunities students should see for themselves uh, in these kind of departments? Hmm. Okay, so the simplest explanation I can give you is that, um, for example, if you have a, a list of numbers um, and I asked you to find um, one specific number out of that list of numbers, then you would have to look at the whole list before you could definitively say that the number is not there, mm. right? But if you were to sort the list, then you need much fewer um, samples to be able to say definitively whether the number is there or not. So the way you structure information 
makes a big difference to how you are able to process it. Mm -hmm. And this is where the whole field of data structures comes from, that if you organize your data in a certain way, then certain operations become much more efficient. Mm -hmm. Now, our minds are very efficient at processing some types of information that is very meaningful. Um, and so cognitive science, in my view, is the science of the data structures of the mind. Mm -hmm. You study what the data structures are that we use to solve problems that we encounter in the real world. And there have been many, many contributions of the cognitive science discipline to the design of artificially intelligent data structures, algorithms, and systems in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, cognitive science is the mother discipline um, of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And for that reason itself, it is a very fascinating field of study. Mm -hmm. uh, the job opportunities, again, they can you can split them in two. One is the more um, trendy thing of being an interaction designer or a... Or, or, shall we say, uh, a, a design specialist or a, a, a behavioral researcher. And there are openings for this sort of positions in most companies. Okay. For those who are more academically oriented, there are deep connections between cognitive science and the cutting edge of machine learning and artificial intelligence research. Mm -hmm. And so people who want to study those areas um, with some depth mm -hmm. um, will also find much of value within the cognitive sciences. Wonderful. Uh, professor, I was going through your web page and uh, I uh, uh, saw one line which was very interestingly written. I escaped with a PhD from Paul Schrader's lab at Minnesota. So uh, I wanted to ask you what, what the meaning of this is. Was the life very difficult or tough at Minnesota? Oh, no. It was the best time of my life. Okay. Uh, so because my PhD was very philosophical and I was essentially just asking a bunch of questions, um, it was my firm conviction that it is, un it is not valuable to anyone, um, which which conviction uh, persists to this day. And so I escaped with a PhD for doing something that has no value. And that's what that phrase means. Okay. So so after so many years of your PhD, you know, after uh, spending uh, your career in academics, uh, may I ask you that have you identified or investigated of, uh, you know, the causes of being in this world? That was the thesis of your PhD. Well, um, as I said, the title was uh, was was um, essentially motivated by Martin Heidegger's uh, phrase uh, "dasein," which mm. which which means being in the world, mm. and it essentially reflected my interest in how do we identify valuation, how do we identify meaning mm. um, in the way we live. And that has been the focus of most of my cognitive science work ever since. Mm. So certainly, um, it has answered some questions, um, it has opened up others. Um, whether there's fundamentally an understanding of how to be in the world is something that is an extremely first person um, experience mm -hmm. that is very difficult to communicate. So mm -hmm. I will not make an effort to do it. Yeah. Okay, Professor, you have done two postdoctors uh, fellowships also. And uh, I wanted to ask you like, uh, what do you think is the uh, you know benefit or advantage of doing post doctorate uh, fellowships after PhD, and uh, why two in your case? Oh, um, so actually that's just uh, if you see the first one is just for one month. Okay. Uh, that was I was I was in Bombay because that's where my wife was, and I was doing nothing. So they said, why don't you get to do some work for us? So it so the first one was not particularly serious. I was just hanging out in Bombay and. I, I just did some work. Second one was um, at, at, at UCSD, and that was essentially where I wanted to actually answer the questions mm -hmm. that I had um, raised in my computer science PhD. I wanted to answer those questions with, with, with behavioral experiments and with the tools that psychology provides. Mm -hmm. And that's why I spent three years at UC San Diego. And that was a great experience mm -hmm. because I learned uh, to use new tools um, in order to try and answer the questions that my PhD work had uh, had raised for me, mm -hmm. and that, in some sense, is the is the value of having uh, done a postdoc in the sense that when you enter research in a serious way in your PhD, mm -hmm. you are sort of limited in the methods and the tools that you have are trained in mm -hmm. um, by virtue of the place that you're doing your PhD in. And so, at some point, once you finish your PhD and you are an independent researcher. Um, you are able to identify gaps in your training 
And then you can go do a postdoc and, and fill in that gap so that you can execute your research program independently. And maybe that requires one postdoc, maybe that requires two. It's entirely a function of your own vision of your weaknesses um, as a researcher capable of conducting independent research. Wonderful. Uh, Professor, nowadays we, we listen some words which are buzzwords in academic and industrial uh, setting and uh, students are uh, more curious and interested to pursue their uh, career in these uh, domains. Uh, these are artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, etc. So I want your opinion, I want uh, views uh, from you uh, about these kind of domains of learning and what are the scopes of these techniques and uh, what scope do you see for these domains in future? Oh, the scope is enormous. Um, the, the hype is completely justified. Um, the only uh, caution that I would advise is that with particularly with the advent of deep learning, there's an... Uh, shall we say, uh, a de-emphasis on understanding the mathematics behind these algorithms and and so on. And so frequently we encounter um, students who have trained themselves well with the algorithmic aspects of, of, of statistical learning, but are not um, solid on probability statistics and linear algebra itself. Um, and so to all of your young viewers who are interested in these areas, I would say that if you want to build a career, in artificial intelligence or machine learning or even deep learning, um, then you should be paying attention in your linear algebra classes um, rather than doing the Coursera deep learning course. Um, <laughs> the, that's the sexy thing to do, okay. but you want to build solid mathematical foundations before doing anything else. And that is required for even cognitive sciences and all. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Professor, uh, I want to uh, see this behavior is one of the very, very complicated thing and predicting behavior and changing behavior. These are very, very difficult things, uh, knowing the kind of individual differences which we observe. My next question to you is uh, related to that only. Uh, you know, to what extent do you think uh, we can mathematically or computationally, we can, uh, you know, model the behavior of the people so that we identify the invariants involved in the human behavior or for that matter, animal behavior. So mathematics and this kind of, uh, you know, computational techniques, how far uh, your entire work is uh, focused on those kind of domains. So to what extent we can predict the behavior or even control these kind of behaviors? Uh, well, um, a great example of predicting behavior is Google search results. Yes. Um, everybody clicks on the first search result, no matter what it is, mm. because people are lazy. Yeah. That's an invariant of human behavior that is very easy to predict. Yeah. Now, obviously, you will say, well, no, I go to the third, second or third, but broadly, Google makes its money by predicting behavior. Yes. They predict what somebody will find relevant, mm. and they put it up front because that's what people do. Mm. Similarly, Facebook's business model also relies on trying to identify what people will spend time on mm. um, in their Facebook feeds. So I have this nice slide that I frequently use um, in motivating people to consider doing cognitive science, where I say the fans companies Mm -hmm. um, essentially are all built upon trying to predict um, and shift behavior. Um, mm -hmm. Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, mm -hmm. um, they're all built on trying to predict, well, what movie will he like, whether if he liked this movie, mm -hmm. um, how do you build up sh uh, design shows mm -hmm. such that people will watch them? Mm -hmm. um, how do you design the news feed such that people will spend more time on it? Mm -hmm. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So that's the... That's the that's the short answer that I'll give you. Um, I can give a longer, more mathematical answer, but this I think is sufficient for this setting. Um, the attention economy mm -hmm. is a buzzword that um, has traction. A lot of money goes into trying to predict and channel behavior mm -hmm. um, at digital interfaces. Mm -hmm. And all of it um, uses principles of cognitive psychology mm -hmm. that have been developed over the past 30, 40 years. So it's a very, very vibrant um, and very, very cutting edge field that we're talking about. So not only we can predict, we can change it also. The behavior of course. Of yeah. So, I mean, we, we, we are on our phones all the time. Nobody would do that before. Now yeah. everybody is stuck to their phones. Yes. Behavior has changed. Yes, yes, that's true. So, so do you find some kind of ethical domains also, ethical lines also, where uh, the scientists and all, they should draw the line when they're changing the behavior of the individual? uh not really no okay then we should not draw the lines 
No, in the sense that there's no incentive to draw these lines. Okay. Mm. And the scientist has no incentive to say, no, this is ethical. So, for example, you you say, I don't want my son to be on the phone all the time. Yes. Right. But 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 they are on the phone. How do you take it away? And if I work in an area which is interested in, in increasing engagement, let's say, mm -hmm. so we call it increasing engagement. Mm -hmm. Now you'll say, why is increasing engagement a bad thing? Maybe you can increase engagement of children in classroom lessons and so on. It's always possible to make up a story yes. that, that, that finesses the ethical problem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is, this is uh, Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. There's no way to put it in. If anybody wants to draw an ethical boundary, they draw it at the point of consumption, mm -hmm. not at the point of production. Mm -hmm. At the point of production, whatever is profitable mm -hmm. will happen. It's at the point of consumption that people have to realize this is bad for me, this is bad for my kids, and, and draw those lines. That is very, very necessary. Mm -hmm. Professor, my next question, that is an impromptu question, I mean, it's not a part of script, but uh, I just thought of, I don't know whether it's relevant to you and I'm whether I should ask it, but I still want to ask you. And that is related to addiction, you know, this uh, gadget addiction among the kids, uh, since you mentioned about the mobiles and people, st children sticking yeah. to that. There is a common problem which you are observing in all uh, kids uh, nowadays, um, you know, from very small age to large age. And parents are uh, actually not knowing what to do, uh, knowing well that we have nowadays nuclear families, one or two kids and those things. So uh, is there any solution to that, Professor? As I told you that it's not part of my script, I still want to ask you. Gadget addiction and behavior of the kids. Yeah, this is going to become controversial very soon. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the solution is grandparents. Okay. And That's the family. solution. Hmm. Huh? Joint families, you mean to say? Um, well, essentially, kids are on phones because there's nothing to engage them. Yes. Um, and there's nothing to engage them because people live in small units, and and so they don't know their neighbors. Uh, neighbors' kids don't play together. Kids don't want to be stuck on phones. But and same with adults. I find even the you know much attraction among kids for uh, technological things like uh, games and all. Rather, even if there, there is something to engage, I mean, students are not finding that, like, as I told you, it's like an addiction. They find more attracted towards these technologies. So, solution will come from the families or from the sure, technologies? Sure. See, kids always find novelty interesting. Yes. And when the novelty comes from the social space, that's engaging. When the novelty comes from a technical space, that's interesting. And it's not just kids, it's also people of all ages. I mean, I'm sure. You are addicted to your phone just as I'm addicted to my phone. Mm -hmm. So this is not really about kids. This is about society in general and the fact that now with devices, we have the ability to acquire novel information mm -hmm. um, at very low cost to us. Mm -hmm. Before you had to go to somebody to gossip. Now the gossip comes to you on your phone, so you have no incentive to gossip. And so there's no need to make friends mm -hmm. in the physical world. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, 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 the nature of social space time itself is distorted. Mm -hmm. um, that's the reality and how we deal with it is, is something that I'm looking forward to understanding. Mm -hmm. And and even uh, there's a lot of need, Professor, to identify to what extent a student is suffering from that addiction. I mean, they, we don't have any parameter to measure as of now to what level is suffering from it. Parents are not aware. And if he's suffering, what is the solution for that? These two are the problems which I'm telling you on the basis of our in field experience of schools and all like parents are having no clue no answer first they are not knowing that their kid is suffering from this second they have no idea what can be the solution for that so if some work related to that pops up from people like you that is going to be wonderful my next question to you professor is related to behavioral experiment how much success you get when you validate your theories by running behavioral experiments um in some cases uh, considerable in some cases, no. Okay. So just as a response, I, I'll give you an example. Um, this whole issue of um, of internet addiction. Okay. There have been lots of studies done that actually demonstrate that it's not really an addiction. It's okay. just habituation. Okay. The, the distinction between addiction and habituation is that when you take things away from them, mm -hmm. then does it come back um, recurrently? Um, if it does, that's addictive. Mm -hmm. um, if it doesn't, then it's just habituation. Um, there's considerable evidence now that 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 internet addiction is not really addiction. It's mostly habituation, okay. um, and that's an example of something that you can easily show as uh, something that's that's useful. So, what is the solution? Use switch the devices off. Mm -hmm. In a month's time, it's gone. 
there's no physiological dependence there's no emotional dependence this is just it's just laziness that keeps it going mm. so, so so it's better to call it internet habituation mm. rather than addiction and that way you don't pathologize the problem and then you can find a behavioral fix that's an example of the sort of thing that behavioral experiments can do they help you differentiate mechanisms for handling something mm. Uh, professor I, i want you to uh, throw some light on the importance of efficient routes for logistic services um so i presume you mean uh, for logistics in general um depending on the scale at which a company or an organization is working um the efficiency may be a big problem or it may be a small problem in the case of up police for example we were able to show that we could provide savings of about 4 crore rupees um at petrol prices um in the range of 65 to 70 rupees which is when we we ran this pilot now the savings would be maybe 6 to 7 crore rupees every year mm-hmm. um by following more efficient routes mm-hmm. so that's in some sense a, a a a numeric estimate of the cost of inefficiency that for example you people is currently face and i'm sure this generalizes to other systems also Yeah, professor, you mentioned something uh, adaptive routing system, and it is proposed by you. Uh, I want to ask you how it is different from classical routing solutions. So, classical routing solutions are great um, when you have demand that is predictable, and when your emphasis on efficiency is also a static parameter. So, for example, you say I want to be this efficient, but when both these things are dynamic, when the demand patterns change. um frequently like where is the frequency of calls for help from the up police coming from um and when your emphasis on fuel efficiency is also fluctuating like this week we have input that there may be problems so we want to not compromise on safety this week um this is a dull week so it's fine if we can um skimp on uh, coverage and save fuel so that sort of input is hard to push into classical routing systems um it fits in very nicely into the framework that we've produced and that's sort of its novelty you 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 just now mentioned about reinforcement learning which is one of the very good way to for learning also i i want to ask you is there something which is called a reinforcement unlearning also i mean can we use the reinforcement as a mechanism uh, you know to unlearn something which we have learned and that is not good for us Yes, this is this is something that is very commonly used in clinical psychology. It's a technique called flooding or exposure therapy. Um, essentially, what you do is, if let's say that somebody has a fear, let's say a fear of closed spaces, claustrophobia, um, or a fear of heights, agoraphobia, and so on. What you do is that you expose them to some degree, not to a great degree, to some degree to the 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 vector of their fear. so that they are fearful and at that point you present um other cues that are associated with sense a sense of safety or a sense of calm and in this way you reinforce associations between these other cues which are which are desirable with respect to the object and by this mechanism you perform unlearning of the earlier association it's not that it's actually unlearned but now the association is distributed among many many um cues and therefore it becomes weaker um so as i said uh, it's a great question it is possible to do reinforcement on learning clinical psychologists do it all the time yeah wonderful uh, uh professor you gave a solution you delivered one solution to kanpur police and uh, that was to design patrolling points for their emergency response vehicles uh can you can you uh, share with us what was the feedback you received from kanpur police and how we can if the positive then what uh, you're planning uh, can that be Uh, same replicated in other places also well um there's some positive findings and there's some not so positive findings the positive finding was that when the actual patrol vehicles complied with the uh, with the patrol points that we gave them um then they were actually more efficient in terms of fuel consumption um and in terms of the response time to the calls that they had to attend Okay. The not so good news was that this compliance was very spotty. Um, in many cases, uh, the vehicles could not comply with our um our instructions for various reasons. They're stuck in traffic jams. They're attending to some emergency. The some some 
some exigency had, had arisen. So the compliance of the patrol fleet as a whole in the randomized control trial that we ran was not excellent. Um, and so at this point, we and the control police are looking at ways to fix that compliance issue um, and then run a different trial. Um, so that's that's where we are at this point. Okay. Uh, uh, Professor, we I found your entire this interaction, this entire your views, very honest, very frank, very candid. And uh, uh, I want to add again to go on one of the things which are written in your website. I, I wonder you have got, uh, you know, very wonderful academic background, your BTEC from IIT and then PhD from abroad, two postdoc fellowships, and then you're writing that you know very little. So any specific reason why you written that on your website? Oh, because the more I learned, the more I realized that everything we know is based on assumptions. Um, and then you question those assumptions and you realize that the assumptions themselves rest on other assumptions and the whole edifice of our understanding is extremely arbitrary. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is always very humbling and it's also always very threatening um, because as you say, I'm a professor of computer science and cognitive science at IIT Kanpur. And I freely acknowledge that every day I say I know nothing and it's an honest opinion. It's not an affectation. Um, there's, there's so much that is not understood. Um, and there's so much that 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 is understood on the basis of assumptions that are so arbitrary. Um, it, is, it, is, it is scary. Yeah. Professor, uh, I'm getting the opportunity to interact with you today. So uh, I'm going to ask you another question, which I feel like asking, again, not part of script. And that is, uh, if you go back to your graduation days, would you have followed the same path or something else? Um, so, um, would I have followed the same path? I guess your question is, what would I, I have done differently? Yes, yes. Um, I would have, I would have, um, have, have um, exercised and taken care of my body a lot more. Um, <laughs> So I, I am very fond of exercise, but I started at 25. Um, I shouldn't have given it up. I, I gave it up when I was in college, um, and that's not something I, I should have done. So if there's something I would have changed, I would have been engaged in intensive exercise all through my college days. Um, that's one thing that I, I, I wish I would have done differently. Wonderful. Professor, my next uh, two questions are directly from the students. As you know, on my platform, majority of the students are... Uh, those who are looking forward to have career in research and higher education and industries and all. So my question next to are uh, from their side, their general queries. Uh, first is, can you suggest some of the latest domains of, you know, uh, research or higher education or whatever in your field of specialization, where students should uh, go forward, proceed forward to a great career? Um, I already answered this. Um, they should study linear algebra, they should study probability, they should study statistics, and they should know how to code. Um, if you know all of that, then any domain that comes in, you will be able to contribute. If you chase fads, um, and if you chase the latest buzzwords, um, you will have unsustainable success. That's, that's not great. The basics are always uh, evergreen, and the basics are always valuable. Pay attention in math class. Don't be scared of math. That's that's what I would say. Wonderful. My last question to you uh, for this interaction is, what do you see in your prospective students? The students who will join you for their master's or maybe for post, uh, doctorate, what do you see in them? Oh, what I just said. Um, they should not be scared of math. Um, they should know how to code. Um, and they should take care of themselves physically. Um, this is something that uh, I see all the time. Physical energy is a great determinant of success. Wonderful. So that brings us to an end of this wonderful session, uh, Professor Nishint. And this was uh, very good. I mean, I could get answers to most of my questions. And I again, I must admit, uh, this is the most honest, candid, and frank interview I ever had. And I really enjoyed it. And I, uh, again, thank you for the time you spared for this interaction, Professor. All right, for the pleasure to be here. Thank you.